All right, welcome Java Asyncs. We are back starting week number five in Java Asynchronous Online. This is your weekly overview video, and I'm excited to show you what we've got cooked up for the next two weeks. So we are getting to the module on looping, and we just finished user input. So those two combined will bring us to our module project, or our chunk project, excuse me, which is the Might We Be Friends uh, flowcharting and interactive project. And so we're going to bring a couple of strands of skills together, including sharing code with Git, uh, as well as the uh, process of running other folks' code on your NetBeans. So for the agenda today, I'd like to show you specifics on the schedule update, uh, do a quick reminder on contact and office hours, and we had a handful, small handful of questions from the weekly work form, which is great. And uh, didn't get any specific feedback, but keep that coming if you've got it. So let's jump uh, into technology rediscovery and take a look at what has been posted. So on our Java master sequence, here's week four. And uh, we're starting here week five, Monday morning. And the module five, uh, while in four loops, is a companion with the Lang 9 textbook chapter four. Let's take a look at the while loops. So um, it would be uh, fair to say that some of the earliest programming environments that were built on computers basically involved these two structures, branching. So uh, branching code with if, meaning we can tell the computer to uh, test some sort of condition. And under the circumstances that the test was passed or it was true, we can do x. Or if it's false, we can uh, do y. And so at the most basic level, computer programs started being highly functional when the computer could make decisions during runtime about what code to run. So that allowed the idea of the computer making decisions that were pre-programmed into it. And by including looping, we can then start reusing test conditions and we can continue executing a set of instructions until a certain condition is met. And so at the base level then, branching and looping, I guess we could say variables. So can you store data and get it back? Can you decide how to operate on those variables based on test conditions? And then can we reuse code or can we repeat things for uh, some predetermined number of cycles or amount of time? And so once we get done with this, this was chunk one, you have in your tool belt a set of primary tools that are cross applicable in all programming languages. They've all got variables branching and looping. And then on top of that, how that variables branching and looping, how those structures are organized uh, is more language specific. But the core is uh, already with us. And so uh, this is a, a fun time in our Java class. And so let's go back to our screen share. And so, oops, sometimes it grays out my screen. I've done quite a bit of work with the uh, videos for this module, so you should be, have a good companion. Um, we've got our setup. So uh, there's a couple of uh, structures that we won't be using. This idea of a hamburger was a, a, a worksheet. Um, and then setting up your workspace, you'll uh, have a number of little projects to do. So set up your classes, as I explained there in the setup. And then um, I, I walk us through starting with the absolute simplest situation of while loops and dissecting exactly how those loops work. And you get a chance to tell your computer to keep doing something indefinitely, which is uh, a neat feeling to think of telling a computer to do something and walking away and it'll just keep doing it. Computers don't get bored. Um, and then we got a question about uh, controlling input with uh, loops, or I guess the question was about how do we go back and get user input if we're not happy with what we got. And um, this project will help us through uh, 
thinking about how to do that. So I'm actually going to defer this question so that you, uh, the asker of that question, can try to program and build that themselves. Um, so the two fundamental loops in Java, uh, well, there's one fundamental looping structure that we can code up in the while structure or the for structure. So the for loop is a cousin of the while loop that allows us to, in a more compact syntax, carry out some of the basic control structures of loops, meaning making a variable that is a controller for our loop, checking a condition using that variable, in this case num loops, and then incrementing the value of a variable as we do the looping. So for and while loops are ones that you'll see in almost every method um, in almost every Java program. So loops are, are incredibly helpful. And I'm gonna encourage you to grab your paper and pencil. Uh, a lot of what we'll do with looping is to try to diagram uh, systematically how we want the looping to work. And drawing a picture of it for your brain will be very helpful. So the a little sample exercise is Social Security Administration has uh, wants to have a kiosk in their front uh, entryway. So folks coming in can decide whether or not they're really able to retire. So we'll do a simple ex exercise using a while loop where ask the user for input, check to see if it's appropriate, and give them an output. And we have the idea of a kiosk that can process as many users that walk up to it without having to reset the program. And I'm going to encourage you to use a shared set of diagram notations for how loops work, because we'll diagram that out much more extensively next week in our Might We Be Friends project. So don't, um, don't forget your pen and paper. Those are your best friend uh, next to your compiler as a programmer. Uh, the next thing in our module is, um, oh, actually, I should take off. Uh, so this exercise flow of friends this, this gets built into our, uh, our project for next week. So you can, you can read through exercise zero and do it as, as you want this week, but you'll have all of next week to work on that. And then uh, the mini projects that we've got are um, uh, kind of the sky's the limit on how we implement this. So this one in, invite you to create a password checker program that will give you a predefined number of attempts and stop asking for the password once your attempts are exercised, which is one of the most important security measures in our modern computing system. Uh, denial of service attacks and, um, and bots are constantly trying to guess passwords and log into systems on the internet. And by locking someone out after a certain number of attempts, we can prevent people from being able to brute force their way in by guessing passwords because their chances of guessing it uh, correctly in a handful of attempts is uh, extremely low. So, um, and then exercise two gets a chance to build in the uh, random number generator to simulate a, uh, a production quality system. And so this is a, a higher level project that might even turn into your final project. Uh, simulation is a whole field of programming that has incredible application across industries because it's a lot cheaper to write a program to simulate how a system works than to build a test system that's not very good and having to tear it down and build it up again. So your mini project here uh, for manufacturing quality is uh, fantastic. And then uh, if you want uh, the, uh, an additional mini project for building a, a quiz program, this is the kind of thing that could take quite a bit of time. So once again, uh, the modules are of different sizes. So I don't want you to get overwhelmed and think, oh my goodness, there's three big projects. I want you to find high focus time to work on the projects that are at your level. And when you feel like you've mastered one of those projects, feel free to set that aside for next week. So um, once again, I, I designed this course to be flexible so that students that are at a higher Java level don't get bored and can still learn things and projects for students that are just learning Java
can be at the, the right level. So I don't want you to, to panic if, if you don't make it all the way through the, the quiz project on this, on this module. So that's it for uh, the module content. And then building on the questions that I was asked, we have uh, one other to-do list in our master sequence. And that is setting up uh, GitHub for your programs. And so let me fix that formatting. Week five, that's better. Okay, so here we are in week five. Um, so the next step is to venture into Git. Um, now, uh, the link that I put up is both a tutorial and a information module. And so uh, there's a pretty extensive discussion, uh, actually recorded uh, me talking to a, a class last time, I think Python 2, uh, using the, the Git tool. And uh, the instructions that I have below the video are step-by-step -step on how to set up an account on a server version of Git called GitHub. And so this is a screen by screen, click by click process for you to build an account first. And then inside that, re re inside that account, we can build a repository, which is a container for putting code. Um, and I have uh, a number of exercises that we'll work through uh, as we venture deeper into Git. So, uh, I'm going to ask you to attempt the Git repository creation. And once you have your Git repo, it'll end up, uh, your homepage will look like this. And this is the URL. So this is github.com, which is a server version of Git. And then there's my username. And then this is my repository. This whole URL is what I'll ask you to paste into our tracker that we used uh, for the repo and then we abandoned repo so now we uh, can use column d for posting your git repo link on on the server so uh, let me give a brief introduction to git without the screen share and then i will uh leave you to it and then we also got a question on um, the mini project on the gas mileage so i'll I'll jump into that if you're curious. Otherwise, uh, this video will conclude. So let's, uh, let's back up. In software development, it's almost always the case that we have multiple folks working on the same project at the same time, especially in an organizational context. And so we have a situation where we've got a couple of folks working. They each have a computer sitting in front of them. And because code is dependent on each other on a large project, we might have uh, coder A and coder B. And coder A and B both are working on file uh, X and file Y. And the problem that Git solves is how do we successfully manage the fact that coder A may edit file X and make changes and file Y might make a couple of changes. Coder B might also make those changes, but in a different location in those files. So how do we, without making a big mess and spending all of our time uh, thinking manually about which changes we want, what Git does is it says, okay, I'm going to, let's group all the files in your system that are related to a project in a container called a repository or repo for short. So repository is just a special directory inside your computer that can be managed by a tool called Git, not Git, but not Get, but Git. 
uh, Git was created by a person named Linus Torvalds in attempting, uh, successfully attempting to coordinate work on building the Linux kernel. So Linux is the operating system that uh, yours truly is using all the time and is also the bedrock of the, um, the Android ecosystem, all of Amazon Web Services, and all of Google Search uses Linux instead of Microsoft Corporation's Windows for running their backend tools. So Git was created in order to build the Linux kernel, and it turns out it's cross-applicable to any software programming endeavor. So <clears throat> what Git does, Git is a, a piece of software that runs on your computer, and it can run on servers, to coordinate the versions of the files in your repository. And the tutorial video that I have posted will explore in perhaps excruciating detail how the Git tool manages the files in your repository. And the uh, companion to a local version of Git is Git on a server that runs a, uh, a more advanced version of the Git tool to coordinate having a central repository that has all of the files that we're working on. So the central repository would also have a copy of uh, X and Y. And when coder A is done working, the coder can push those files as a, in a bundle up to the server, and so can coder B, and any differences between the changes made between your two coders are merged uh, using advanced algorithms for figuring out which changes make sense to create official merged versions of file X and file Y. And so uh, what I'm gonna ask you to do is go directly to github.com, which is one of many online tools that hosts Git repositories on a publicly accessible server. And you'll make your repository, you give it a name, and then when we're ready, as we move through the course, you'll be able to pull your files on the Git server down to your local version of the repository, make changes, commit those changes, meaning uh, create a, a point of saving that can be restored at any future state uh, or any future date to a given state in which you change it. And so my proposed workflow is we start on git, github.com, and then we will move to working with the repositories on your local computer. Um, so one of the differences between git and just a file uh, an online cloud drive is that the idea of saving a file, we don't ever talk about, uh, well, we do talk about saving a file, but saving is not what Git is thinking about. Git will think about files in terms of commits. So commit is like a named save of all files in your repository. And so let me show you a little bit about how this works using our, our class code. And, uh, and, and we'll build this knowledge slowly over time. So I have uploaded all the files that I use to create my tutorials on a public repository that is linked uh, right here, GitHub repository for class code. So when I click this, I get a github.com repository called Java CIT 111. And you'll see that I have directories that are organized by, uh, by components. So all of our chunks are in uh, components and then the various uh, module files are inside each individual, um, individual chunk. So it um, looks like I had a couple of uh, adjustments. I'm looking for operators, mileage machine. Okay, so what we can see here is I can navigate down into the particular files and then I can actually see the source code here. 
Now this is not uh, connected to a Java compiler. So if we want to interact with these files, we want to pull down that class repository into my local system. Uh, and I, I shouldn't have used that word pull. In this case, we just want a copy of everything in the repository onto my local system. So the operation that we're going to undertake is, is called a clone. Um, and so let me just demo this and then we'll answer the question about the mileage machine. So here's, uh, here's my repository. And you'll notice there's a green button at the home of the repository. If I click this and I click code, uh, I get a URL, which is actually this URL uh, with the HTTPS automatically prepended. I'm going to copy it. And then on my local computer, I can navigate using my terminal um, into a, let's make a directory called Java. And what I'm going to do is because I have Git installed on my local system, I can start giving commands to Git. And the first command I'm going to give it is, hey, Git, I want you to clone. What do I want you to clone? I want you to clone the repository located at the URL that I'm about to give you. So I just paste it in this URL. And when I hit enter, it will execute. So it told me cloning into a directory called Java CIT 111. So now when I list my directory, I see, ah, look, there it is. And I can navigate into that with CD and notice if I put these side by side, that I have, in fact, a full copy of everything in my repository. So let's jump back up to code. Um, oh, look, it tried to get all fancy with me and shrunk my, um, it's like, oh, you must be on a mobile code. View code, I have to click a button. That's nice to view the files. Um, it's not nice, I was being facetious. Uh, so you'll see, look, um, CIT 111 NetBeans, CIT 111 NetBeans, Donut Land, Donut Land. The directories and files that are prepended with a dot are hidden, uh, which just means that by default on most file browsers, they won't display because most users won't directly interact with them. They're directories that contain instructions for, uh, for programs that need configuration directives or data. Um, and so dot git is inside there, but we're not, we don't see that in the official listing. So one of the handy things is that I created a NetBeans project that lives inside CIT 111 NetBeans that contains some directives so NetBeans can turn it into a, a functioning project. So if I load up NetBeans here, I can then say file open project and if I navigate into my Java directory that I just made into CIT 111 and then NetBeans, look, it recognizes that CIT 111 NetBeans is in fact a Java project with a little cup of coffee next to it. So if I say open project, it's going to build my whole file structure just as I had it on my other computer where I actually did the coding. So it allows me to share uh, not only files, but the entire file structure with other people uh, in the world that have internet connections. And so I, if I want to explore my uh, mileage program, I can uh, navigate into my packages. So I think that was under uh, operators. And here's our mileage machine. So if I double click this, now I have a uh, a working project. And so this was my, um, this was uh, my sample code for you in the mileage program. So let's, uh, I want to, I got a, we got a question for how do you do the extension exercises on these? So let's take a look um, back to Java home. Module three, road trip. Uh, so we got the code along. Um, we got the plan, and um, 
we got a question for the extension exercises. Where were they? How did how did that how did that get asked? Async. Can you go over the mileage per gallon program listed at the end of this module? And can you go over how to code the extra exercise you suggested at the end of this gas station one? Um, so let's, it would be, the more specific you can get in your questions, the more likely it is that I'll be able to answer it nicely. Um, so which particular additional exercise? Um, I feel like I, um, I would start by reviewing my video built in there and let's see if I can give you, So there was the sample uh, road trip output. Um, so one of the, uh, the ways that I designed this project was when I assigned it, we didn't have a looping under our belt. And so what I was proposing in the design is that you think about the road trip in terms of legs and each leg then involves a display of the variables associated with your road trip. How much gas do you have? How many miles you've gone? How many miles you have left? How many people you have in your car? And how much money you've spent? And so uh, ideally, you'll be able to think about the leg process as something that you can start looping once you've got loops under your belt. So, um, one thing that might be helpful is I actually have a, a task key uh, built in that you might be able to check. So if you, uh, in our file, if you go to view the solution code in GitHub, this will bring up the code that I'm, uh, that I'm showing you with the completed legs. Um, and what you'll note is we find ourselves uh, repeating a lot of similar print line and output statements. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that we're going to learn to loop over and then break off into individual chunks of code called methods. So let me, sorry, let me screen share that. Um, so what I did was I clicked on, here was our, uh, here's the end of the, road trip and then I clicked on solution code. And this is where I put up. Um, so once again, I've got my variables that I built into main, how many passengers I can possibly hold, how many are in the car, if the car is full, how far I've gone, how much money I have, how much uh, distance I have left to get to Moab, and whether or not I've traveled all the way there. And so the idea of uh, leg distance is that at any given point along the road trip, I can pause and adjust my odometer, adjust how far left I have to go. And so the way those adjustments are manifest in the code are basic assignment statements into the what we we'll, what we call like our our trip or our program variables. So, as I um, my first leg is a quarter of my distance. So, how far is this leg? Well, it's my total distance times 0.25. So, a quarter of my total distance, and then I print it out. I log, I update my odometer. So remember. When we see that equal sign, the single equal sign, this is your assignment statement, not mathematical equals. And our brain needs to see the equal sign and immediately think right first, left second, or in other words, boil everything down on the right hand side of the equal sign or the assignment operator to a single value 
that can then, in step two, be stored in the container on the left. That container should be a variable whose type uh, is, can store whatever the type is of the data that was computed on the right hand side. So tripodometer is a double and leg distance is also a double. So those two make a final double value that I can store in tripodometer. And then I can adjust. Uh, on the other hand, I'm getting closer to Moab. So in this case, I want to see how far I need to get to Moab, take out how far I've gone in this particular leg, and then I'll save that value. I'll overwrite what was in distance to Moab. And then I'm just simulating seeing a hitchhiker. And then I use my control statements to decide whether or not I can pick up a hitchhiker. Um, so car full is a variable that is Boolean. So in this case, I'm using my assignment up. I'm using my equal signs as a double equal sign that's mathematically equals. Excuse me. So I'm asking, is car full false? If it's not false, then I can go ahead and pick up the hitchhiker. Um, so once I picked up the hitchhiker, then I can do some computations around how much money I spent on gas up through this leg. So once again, sequentially, I'm following this pattern of for each leg, I want to carry out a couple of operations. So um, on each leg, what do I do? I um, update how far I've driven. So update odometer, update distance to destination, you can simulate finding, um, so you see a hitchhiker, you have two H's? I don't think so. Well, see hitchhiker um, and uh, pick up if you can or if you feel like you're in a spot to do that. So test uh, if you can pick it up, pick up a person. Um, and then um, update my gas price. Gas price. So compute gas price and uh, subtract from your cash. And then display output. So this set of steps is the kind of thing that we are hard coding one, two, three, four, four times. Um, and this is what I want you to think about in your looping, which is how would I build this in so I can loop and do all of these things um, however many legs are on my trip. Maybe I want a trip that has 20 legs. And the last thing I want to do is copy and paste stuff and have to tweak it 20 different times. And so if there's any change, I have to change 20. <laughs> I have to change 20 almost similar blocks of code, and that's a very error-prone activity. So just be thinking about how you could convert this into a loop. Um, and so you'll see in my sample code, after each one of my legs, I do the same thing. I set my leg distance, then I do my hitchhiking, then I do my fuel price, and then I dump the, the leg distance out. And so this should start feeling repetitive um, because I want you to think about how we could turn this into a loop uh, this week. So without a specific uh, questions, I'm going to leave that as the answer to uh, the inquiry from your work log and encourage you to, when you're asking questions, be as specific as you can about which section I can help explain. Uh, and that will 
uh, be useful in me getting you useful feedback. Um, and finally, I, I skipped this after our schedule updates. Um, I, I really like working in Java and working with students in Java. I'm at the stage with my workflow that um, it's unfortunately not time uh, feasible for me to do technical help over email. Um, and I mentioned that last week and I'm, I'm going to mention it again because I, in my heart, I feel like I'm under, under serving you as students. I'd love to be able to sit and answer technical questions on email because for some that's probably more comfortable um, a way to communicate. Uh, in the asynchronous programming land, unfortunately, the problems are so technical that most of the time, my first response to you will not get us to where you need to go. And so there'll be a back, and then I'd have to respond a second time. And that's, that's just not uh, time feasible with, with the, the class load and project load that I've got. So um, I encourage you to ask me procedural questions over email if you'd like. Um, when is this due? Or letting me know that you're behind on something. Um, but really, if, if you need technical help, if you want to do a code together, uh, the office hours that I have every week are open for you. And uh, once again, I have six hours posted during the week on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. And um, I can also, for those of you that have complicated schedules, I can meet with you after my uh, nine o'clock class, my six o'clock class gets over. So the normal office hours are going to be once in the afternoon and then from five to six p.m. every evening. Uh, and then if neither of these work, the next area for scheduling would be after my evening class at about nine p.m. So um, you don't even have to ask, you can just uh, pop on to any of those Zoom links. They're all the same on, on the system. All the Zoom meeting rooms are the same. And you can just hop on at about 9 o'clock, 8.45, and uh, hang out until I'm done with that class. And then we can do uh, some screen sharing and then help debug. So I've made myself uh, as available as I can during the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays that I work on CCAC stuff. Um, and then if none of those work, we can schedule a time on Sunday, but I definitely have a strong preference for the uh, scheduled office hours. And that's just the reality of my current time constraints. So thanks again for your patience with that. And um, remember to fill out your, your work tracker. Uh, someone asked uh, what to post. Um, I only need your mini project stuff. I, I don't need the... Uh, coding exercises, unless you had a specific question, you could say, I uploaded code in my code box and it doesn't work, and I think it's this line, and I think it's this reason, and I tried X and Y, can you help? Um, so uh, the posting of the code is just a, a way for me to get a sense for what your code looks like, and if they're exercises, they'll probably all look the same, so they won't be very useful data. So once again, thanks again for being in the class, don't forget to do your work report uh, by Sunday morning and uh, have a great week.